Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Tom Dillon, uh, part of the team at Regenerate Outcomes. Uh, joined on the panel today by <laughs> Nicole Masters, the Understanding Ag team, uh, the Soil Mentor app team, and uh, four farmers who will introduce themselves later. Uh, we have Dan Herdman, Tom Wood Aldham, uh, Liz Geneva, and George Hosier. Uh, Nicole needs a little introduction to you all, uh, suffice to say. Uh, she, she's a world-renowned soil scientist and regenerative farming advisor, uh, and she'll be discussing with the farmers uh, various topics <coughs> uh, which arise from uh, data which is being collected uh, in the field via the Soil Mentor app. Um, the app is a great tool to help farmers develop observational skills and, uh, and read the clues which um, <coughs> the land can give. Um, from our part at Regenerate Outcomes, we focus on providing a, a long-term education service for farms, which includes these types of webinars, and uh, as well as a one-to-one -one, uh, mentoring program led by our partners, Understanding Ag. Um, so the data which you collect via the Soil Mentor app will make this mentoring process more personal and, and relevant to your farming experience, if you like. Um, and in parallel to the education service we provide to farms, we baseline <coughs> and monitor the increases of soil carbon stocks, which result from the buildup of uh, life forms in your soil over time. Uh, but how we do that is one is not one for today. And uh, this webinar will be focusing on the Soil Mentor app uh, and its metrics. Um, but if this approach of taught and, and self-taught regenerative farming uh, appeals and please get in touch and we'll follow up in the coming weeks um, but over to Nicole and uh, Victoria to, sh to share the field data thank you excellent thank you so much Tom thanks for the invitation I really appreciate the collaboration I just want to note that I'm not a soil scientist I'm an agroecologist um, I feel like I'm not pedantic enough or data driven enough to be a soil scientist <laughs> so I'm a generalist which means I'm interested in and more in the patterns and that's what I want to hear from farmers themselves that are involved in this is uh the farmers that we have their data are they on the screen have we got a video with them with Tom Liz Dan George you can see Liz George Dan, Tom, excellent. All right, so we're all here. Um, really appreciate the time that you guys have taken to um, collect this data so that we can have a chat about it. Um, Soil Mentor is something that we've had the, the privilege to be able to be involved in the development of this Regen platform. And for me, this data needs to be usable. It needs to be informative in terms of either looking backwards or looking to the to the future. So as we go through this, I would really like to hear a little bit of the history of the areas that you've chosen. Um, and yeah, let's just dig into it. I do invite you to use the Q&A at the bottom. Um, if we're talking specifically about your field, then just speak up, um, ask questions as we go. I do want this to be of of value to you guys. So we were going to start with George, if that's okay. Um, yeah. Hi, hi, George. Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, where you chose to do your sampling and a little of the history? Um, okay. So uh, just a very brief um, overview of the farm. Um, we're a mixed beef and arable farm, um, 625 hectares in the south of England. Um, we've been zero till for nine years, um, and on the cattle side, we move the cows every day, um, and have done for a, about five years, I think. Um, the fields that I chose, we've got quite an eclectic mixture of soil types on our farm from some very, uh, thin flinty chalks, um, some with clay cap, some without, down through some nice, easy working chalk down onto some clay and then green sand below. Um, and I tried to get a, a mix of soil types. So 
one of the fields, Bushy Two, was up on um, up on the the flints. Um, and the first time I went to dig a soil pit, I took a spade, not a fork, um, and I couldn't get into the ground. Um, lesson learned. Um, and then I went down onto uh, some of the loamy chalk. Um, a field that's uh, so the first field, sorry, is a herbal lay that's been in for uh, four years. It's coming out next year and going back into the arable rotation. The second field was wheat this harvest. It's gone into a cover crop before going into spring barley in, in the spring. Um, and then I went down onto some of our sort of heavier clay uh, soils. And uh, that's a field that's two, three years into a herbal lay. Um, so it's got another another year and a bit before it goes back into the arable rotation. Thank you. That was a, a, a beautiful, quick overview. Um, Victoria, do you mind sharing these images? If we can go. Let's take a look. Excellent. So the new lease, that is your Lomi. That's, that's down on the, uh, well, it's, for us, it's clay clay ground, but it's it's clay over chalk, basically. Um, it's at the heavier end of our farm. Excellent. And it looked like you saw pretty good nodules in um, from these photographs. Uh, yes. Yeah, um, the better nodules were in buttocks one, I think, compared to um, Newley's. Newley's was disappointing, really actually I, um there were some but not as many as i would have hoped so victoria if you go to a fourth column third row um where we've got yep that one beautiful click on that so i think the important piece of this if you zoom in a bit is um you're disappointed because these are these are really great nodules no no and... i wasn't disappointed with this field <laughs> no no the... but um it's training our eye for what what is normal, and and this really is normal. But what we've normalized is what you've actually seen in the new lease, which is we see properties really struggling for um, any nodules. Any nodules they do have will be white. So you can see beautiful pink color, even though you haven't pinched these. If we pinch them, they're going to be blood red inside. So, what's that telling us? Any idea, George? Um, they're actively. Uh, well, the bacteria in there are actively um, taking in nitrogen and um, converting it to plant available forms, I hope. Yes, excellent. So sometimes we might find these nodules will be green, which means they've been fixing and then they've stopped. So we ask the question of, has something changed? Maybe it's temperature. Maybe a cow just peed on that patch. That'll turn those nodules green. They'll actually stop. Um, if they're white, then we want to ask the question of what's happening potentially with trace elements. So white means they haven't been fixing at all. Um, and the two trace elements I'd look to would be cobalt and molybdenum to start with. So it, there's many, many minerals involved with nitrogen fixation, but these two will, will just stop nitrogen fixation in its tracks. So these are really lovely to see in terms of drilling down on the the micro, like, you know, digging a hole and taking a look at things like this. Um, and also if they're white, what we're seeing on some properties is a very little formation of nodules at all. Um, that could be, you know, really acidic conditions, could be a lack of having rhizobia. We do find that um, that's not true on many properties that, unless you're coming out of forestry, there's generally rhizobia. If we can skip out of that, Vic, um, can we look at, at the bigger picture of that field if you go down? Is it the one with the dog? No, that's bushy. No, I but don't. it's is the one with the pot down the bottom on no. the left. Yeah, we take um, a look. With this one, left, left of the screen with left bottom row. Okay. Yeah. Um. So this is typical of what this field looks like. Yes. Yeah. 
So oh, what's in it? Uh, so that's multi-species cover crop. Um, the wheat was harvested with a stripper header, so the straw's long, but on the ground mainly. Um, there's buckwheat, um, radish, vetch, uh, linseed, uh, phacelia, turnips. Um, that'll be grazed around Christmas time is the plan by the cattle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And you'll find that, that that stubble breaks down pretty well? Uh, it's It's not completely gone by next harvest but it's it's on the way out uh it's it's certainly breaking down quicker now than it was three or four mm -hmm. years ago um mm -hmm. it's it's cycling better than it was yeah excellent and i think that's a really important piece of so if we're doing the sampling or using soil mentor what we've got right now is just one moment in time and we don't know is the system moving forwards or backwards? And so your observations and to notice things like stubble digestion is a really key part of is this is this shifting, is this shifting in the way that I want? So, you know, to come back at the same time next year and repeat your soil mentor is going to give you much, you know, more in-depth insights into this. Um, Victoria, if you can go back, let's just look at the bigger picture of at the top left. And just look at this pasture cover in um uh so the second yep that one so this is the new lease you've got yeah. a little bit of clover in there how much clover percentage uh, there's, there's quite a lot of clover in there now it's it's amazing how these herbal lays you know you put them in year one there's quite a lot of grass and it depends. It depends when you plant it. But this one we planted in the autumn and the grass has got away really well and not many herbs. And as it's gone on year on year, the herbs tend to um, sort of come through more and more. Um, mm -hmm. So the, there's a lot of clover and quite a lot of chicory out there now. Um, Lovely. This was cut for uh, hay slash silage um, in first week of july i think it was um and it hasn't been touched since and we'll we'll graze that um sometime in the winter you can go back vic and look at i'd like to see the nodules on yep the next photo over so just pointing to what george was saying about feeling so at the top third photo so that's one yeah that was I think that was um, uh, a clo red clover and I couldn't find any nodules on it. But what you can see is um, evidence of a lot of insect damage. So you can see those sort of swollen galls a little bit, mm -hmm. though that's actually insect damage. You see there's a hole to the bottom left and uh, yeah. to the left as well. So, and not a lot of root hairs. So, um, and actually on that clover sample you had before, there was evidence potentially of a clover root weevil, I would say, or, yeah. So again, you know, just observing some of this because it's it's all saying, it's all telling you something about nutrition, telling you about soil health, you know, do we have adequate defense? Are these plants, you know, really set up for optimal health? You know, so to compare this route to the other route, I think it's um, it's it's interesting. You know, we are looking at different soil types too. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. And and sometimes I think to to do your comparisons, what I really suggest is a good idea is finding your same soil type, best soil, worst soil, and look at those visual assessments and go, how do I make my worst soil look like my best? And how do I make my best better? If there's such a word, you know, so <laughs> how... Um, and then that that's going to just give you more of this comparison, especially in the first year when we haven't got historical data to compare to. Um, but I think your photos are really good. Like we can, you can see how clear clear that is. Um, Victoria, if you want to go to the region, the dashboard. Um, Nicole, sorry to interrupt. Uh, a question came in from Antonio. Uh, I think you want to take questions live, so 
Um, mm -hmm. But I think what you've just explained um, answers Antonio's questions. Um, he's, I think, Antonio, I don't quite, don't quite understand, but I think he's asking what happens if Legume doesn't show any nodules. Um, but Antonio, just, just send in another message if that's not answering the question already. Yeah, Sergeant so um, it, it potentially that's where we're not getting the irritation from the bacteria, that something's um, impacting on um, the communication with the rhizobia in the soil. Like I said, there's very few examples now where we don't have rhizobia. Um, there's been such a long history of rhizobia use and inoculant on um, seeds that, that, yeah, really the only place that if you survey trying to find rhizobia, the only places we find where that's where you're not going to find a resident population is in forestry. Um, so I'd be looking to what's been happening. Why is that plant not signaling perhaps, you know, again, that could be nutritional. Um, but yes, we, we, we're gen generally finding pretty low biologically active soils and poor trace element mobility. We will see hardly any um, nodules forming whatsoever and I wouldn't I wouldn't take it just from one plant if you find that there's none on one plant and you dug a hole dig a few more holes same with doing our BRICS barometer um, so here the the test of the BRICS barometer was to take um, use your refractometer to measure the BRICS in a desired plant and then compare that to the BRICS in an undesirable so here George you found that um, it was two there was a difference of two so like your grass was I'm gonna guess like six, five. Yeah, it was, yeah. I think it was seven in in that field and five yeah. on the thistle I found. Oh, so actually, you're you, that's pretty good. It's actually really good, George. So the this um, the bricks barometer normally it would be orange because the the thistle is higher. So we just need to check on that, Victoria. If you can take a look, because um, not right now. Yeah. Not right now, but just keep that in mind. Um, so thistles, often we find a thistle will have a higher bricks than grasses if it's encroaching. So if we find that the thistle has a lower bricks than your preferred plant, that's a really good sign. So what that potentially means, or what it does mean is the grass is actually in better shape than um, some of these indicator plants like a thistle. And it means that the grass will be exuding more of its um, metabolites out its roots to feed microbiology and it's altering um, that that pastoral situation away from a thistle so really 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 good to find George to see that situation happening um, I'm interested in actually in all the samples that we've looked at the earthworms are really low and you know this is kind of an optimal time for earthworms you know the soils are still pretty warm um, yeah. Do you what numbers do you typically find, George? Have you had a history Norm of yeah, normally find, worms? Uh, normally find uh sort of um around sort of twelve to fifteen, that sort of level. Right. Um, I don't so know. Yeah, it was unusual. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, they just had a study that came out today saying that um and I need to go back and look at it, but it was something like 30% of all production across the world is due to earthworms. Um, so it's like, it's a really important organism. It is one of our indicators, especially early on um, of, you know, how well is the system turning over? We have counted as, um, I've counted over a hundred worms in a shovel. Um, and, you know, you're really seeing a lot of worm castings being laid down. We're really seeing a lot of, um, burrows for water and air to be moving through and seeing that mixing of stubble um, and potentially if you've got any disease material sitting around on the surface they're going to be taking that down so to see that um, that low I'd, I'd be interested okay what's happening and again nutritionally you know you'll have good calcium levels but there's potentially something else going on um, and that infiltration at 23 minutes something is going on um, what do you think? So you've yeah, only done yeah. one one infiltration, or have you done infiltration in other areas? Uh, I've done. I uh, haven't done many infiltrations. Um, that that was the one that really disappointed. I mean, the earthworms is 
strange because I, as I say, I normally see more, but there was plenty of evidence. So plenty of uh, worm holes I was seeing, but I just didn't count very many worms. But the infiltration rate um, concerns me, but then um, it doesn't tally with what, you know, we last week, um, so the week before I took these samples, we had two rain events, both over 50 mil of rain. Yeah. And the ground took the rain, you know, there was no no runoff. It took it easily. Yeah. Um, which doesn't then tally with the infiltration rate um being so slow. Um, Can we go to the picture, Victoria, of this field, um, the visual? You know, you've just had 100 millimetres of rain. You can see these photos. The soils do look really wet. Can you go to the second row? Um, okay, so it's just that top row. This is our soils. Uh, so if you look at the total, rooting depth total, so... Second column, top. Yep, let's look at that. So can you see that layer at 14 centimetres? Yeah. Yeah. So, and then there's another one at probably six centimetres. Yeah. So that, that'll be part of what's going on. That soil does look quite dense. Did you put, um, did you... Did you have a plastic bag or put your hand underneath the water while you were pouring in the water? Uh, I poured it onto my hand. Yeah. 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 So. Excellent. Yeah. Because sometimes what we find is people pour water straight in and it'll actually slake on the surface. You'll crust it and then mm. water won't really move through. But there's certainly a lot of indicators like visually the soil is quite is very different from um, the other the other sample site. So you can see there's less. Less porosity certainly indicators that there's not as much air and water movement, and that's going to point to. You see, there are nodules on this one, that that clover there. You know, yes. that clover's really, it's working. It's working for you, and that's where you know using these like chicory and buckwheat, um, those radishes are really going to help just to address this issue. So this came out of no-till last year. Uh, New Lees uh, was two years ago the grass was planted, I think. Yeah. 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 So potentially, you know, we're coming out of cropping. There can be, um, there can be ke ag chemicals in these layers as well. So just looking at the suppression of opening these soils up and that's where that diversity is, is really, really key in um, re and regeneration. This, yeah, thanks. This field was going in, went in, when it went into the herbal lay, that would have been the first time in my lifetime that it's it's not been inarable. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Um, so if you'd taken this a year ago, you would see that actually these, that, that these soils are on that healing journey. You know, I'd expect to see these in much worse shape. Um, Nicole, another question's come in um, from Ian. The use of inoculants on legumes and pulses is much more prevalent in the US than in England. Typically, it would only be lucerne and alfalfa that would be supplied with an inoculant in the UK. Might that affect the availability of rhizobia? Yeah, absolutely, Ian. And that, that sort of surprises me. I mean, certainly in New Zealand, we don't, um, you know, all our clovers are put out with a rhizobia. Um, but also think... Uh, We've had legumes growing in fields in the UK for thousands of years, you know, in, in meadow situations. So the the carry-on of rhizobia is much more native. Um, and you think how many of these species actually are English that they're exporting around the world. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's quite funny going to the UK because you see what's weeds in the rest of the world. It's like, oh, this is where they come from. So I think you would find there's a pretty good latent native um, bank of rhizobia. Be a good one to test. Um, well, thanks for that, George. I'm just aware of the time. I think we need to keep moving on, but great job. Thank you. Thank you. You're going to go to Tom? 
just trying to unmute. Hi. Um, Hi. So, quick, quick, quick background to the farm. We're based in Northumberland, where it never seems to stop raining. Um, we're farming nine. My brother and I farm nine hundred acres. Chris, who's with me, is hands on. I'm not. Uh, we've got three hundred acres of dairy, three hundred acres of pasture, and three hundred acres of, of arable, roughly speaking. Um, the dairy is uh, we're, we're complete novices at regen agriculture. We decided to do it. So what you're going to see is probably a bit of a horror show, um, but hopefully there'll be some indicators on that. Um, so we, I don't know whether you've got five fields or three fields, because we did another two at the weekend. Um, but the three fields we did to start with, uh, one was um, a stubble following winter barley. The other two were, uh, they've been out of arable into grass for four and five years respectively. Um, and uh, one of the features which we decided to focus on was they, they've all had grass margins in for the past 22 years, I think, where they went another stewardship. So we took parallel infiltration tests on the grass margins and in the stubble, and, which was very revealing, uh, not always consistent. Um, and bearing in mind, we, we got bored after 15 minutes on infiltration because we didn't see anything was happening, so we gave up. Um, <laughs> yep, I can relate. But but there was some the the other two we did at the weekend. Uh, there was one remarkable one where uh, one of the grass margins, the water just disappeared straight in on the on the one inch. Uh, yeah. Whereas on ten yards away uh, on the uh, the stubble, uh, we didn't we we gave up after fifteen minutes. It just was not moving. Mm. Um, we th we've had a go at identifying rhizome sheaths and. Uh, really no legumes in anything so it's any nodules i don't think no. um revealing all sorts of stuff to us we don't know what we're doing fascinating yeah. well thank you for taking part and i think yeah. uh you know sometimes when we're going through people's soils and, and, and like this I, I think of it as ruffling through the underpant drawer you know we really are looking at your most hidden yeah. place on, on the property uh, and often one that people don't look at at all. So thank you very much for your courage at showing us your underpants. Um, Victoria, if you could um, click on, let's look at the um, the Regen dashboard first. Okay, so so you've got the two the two fields that we did at the weekend with the Lingy field grazing, the three fields actually, Lingy field grazing and the bare pasture. Um, the grass margin two one was the one, the only one where we had it. Uh, where are we? The the third one down. Uh, that was the one where the infiltration, uh, the water went straight in um, on the on the on the the one inch one. Um, whereas the uh, the arable bit, uh, we don't seem to have recorded, but uh, it it went on for a long time. Uh, and a mix of earthworms. We're quite good at counting earthworms. We we got that one. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Good work. Yeah, that was your job, was it, Chris? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, was photo I was photographing and digging earthworms. <laughs> Which I think is a good move. Um, Victoria, if you can go to the photos. Uh, if it gives you any um, confidence, we sampled around the Auckland area in New Zealand and found on average those fields were taking 46 minutes to infiltrate an inch of water. Um, and those are beautiful volcanic soils. So yes, uh, any time we're over 12 and a half minutes, we have, we have an issue, but um, these soils look very wet. Are we able to see the CG bare pasture, the, these uh, margins that Tom is talking about, Victoria? Can you um, search you scroll, for... Scroll, scroll, on, scroll on down. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. scroll up, I think, sorry. Yeah, uh, where are the margins? These, the, that's all the grass. So if you go... Uh, where are we? I've noticed we have 1,200 images in this folder. Yeah. So I, someone I, likes I wanted, there. I, I wanted to be a <laughs> photographer when I grew up. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the blue quarry grass margin... Uh, I've spelt it wrong. It means uncompacted. We we did one grass margin where we suddenly realised there'd been tractors driving up and down it, uh, and oh. we, we couldn't get the spade in. I think. Um, but the 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 blue quarry, the middle section there, um, that was one of the infiltration ones. Yeah. Maybe the next page. 
Victoria, I can't see their um, soil profile. Okay. Actually, that second one, top, can we just zoom into that? What are we looking at? Yeah, what's that? Uh, so is there some um, undigested grass, stubble? So it's on the Which side. Is, blue, is that the blue quarry, does it say? Oh, I can't see the blue quarry. Yeah. It does. What were we looking at there? I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, it could be, looking at it, it could be actinomycetes. So they're a, a, an important bacteria for the breakdown of organic material, I'm just guessing. I think rather than there's a bunch of different things it could be, but I suspect that's probably what it is. No, that's fine. Zoom out. That's what I'm sure. And so these are, these margins have never been grazed. No, they haven't. They just they get cut once a year. Um, and to the couple of the arable fields, we're going oh. we're going to legume fallows for a couple of years on them. So if you can take uh, that grass margin and compact it, and then yeah, click on that. So this one was the the one where you've got tractor traffic? No, the uncompacted one, I think. It's, it should be uncompacted rather than incompacted, but um, th this was not compacted. So it's a lighter soil? Um, it's it's the same soil, but that, that doesn't get cut or anything. It won't have been cut mm -hmm. and anything Sorry, the, yeah, for, yeah. for, you know, 20 years since it... Th this bit know. was actually outside the cut area. It was close into the hedge. Um, and this was the one where the, the water went straight through, I think it was. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the one inch infiltration, which took us by surprise. Yeah. If we zoom in a bit, Victoria, I'm trying to see, like, is that a, a lighter texture in terms of more sand? Yeah. So we are, we are, uh, sandy, silty, loam soil. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that'll be part of it. Now, notice that there's, some darkening on the top, that top two and a half, three centimeters, and then it gets quite pale. What we like on this though, is that we're not seeing like a rapid change in color. So that color kind of evenly fades out. Um, but yeah, a bit of an indicator that there's, you know, there's still work to be done, especially these margins probably aren't being, you know, don't have any animal impact. Um, hard to see on the surface. Can you go to the next photo, Vic? Uh, uh, okay, we're more over. What we're not seeing, it, yeah, there is. So you can see the huge difference. <laughs> um, you know, people think that you can't compact sandy soils, and um, yes, you can. Uh, so some of the visual indicators here, you can see obvious plates, that plate structure, where, and that's going to be a limitation to water moving through. I also see moss as being an indicator of a soil not breathing. Um, so think, uh, basically, yeah, we're slowing down that movement of air and gas exchange. And so soils like this can actually be net losses of greenhouse gases because we haven't got adequate gas diffusion. We haven't got um, that aggregate structure, the crumbs, because a big part of what's happening in the crumbs is our gas diffusion um, and is, you know, our whole, whole carbon and nitrogen cycle. So when we when we lose structure, then we're actually losing um, free nitrogen, um, free free available nitrogen to your following crop. So this is why building aggregate structure is so important, building these crumbs, because inside those crumbs, they almost act like the nodules of a legume in terms of here's gas exchange and nitrogen fixation can happen inside them um, because of biological activity. Yeah. Okay. Was it there was quite a lot of moss on the uh, on the on the cell surface. Yeah. 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 Which also tells us that we have a lot of um bacterial activity. And so potentially that can um uh, undermine, I guess, the quality of what we're trying to grow because um we may see more you know, prevalence of fungal diseases or bacterial diseases when soils become like this. Um, I imagine you're using some kind of chemical, you have been using chemical controls. Yeah. Yeah. Well, basically, the, the, the arable, uh, our story of woe is the arable has been fairly well abused for 30 years by third parties, effectively. Um, and bad financial decision, but we took it back in hand this year. 
Um, yeah. And after a stonking harvest that someone else got last year, we've um, taken a bit of hit on this one. Yeah, yeah, I can I can understand that. It's the it's this chicken and egg situation that we have when um, you're coming out of high chemical use, um, and you know you want to be able to grow a crop, but in the meantime, and this is where you know being able to um, support crop health and that could be nutritionally or some of the biologicals that we put on seed just to um just to overcome these limitations and, and get a crop growing um there's a what, question what, what our, think, oh, sorry to interrupt but what, what, what our plan is um under a scheme where we're going into a, two years of legume fallow and then two years of cash crop to try and bring the soils back into better shape yep when you say legume fallow, you're talking diversity of yes. legumes? Yeah, talking diversity, deep root, um, and lots of legumes. It's really nitrogen fixing, to be honest. Yeah, it's, it's what it is in the, in the legume fallow. Yeah. And this this is one under one of the schemes that's available. So we'll, we'll get paid for doing that, for not taking any crop off at all for two years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we're, you guys we're, have we're hoping that that's going to help get these soils but we're trying to accelerate, yeah, because we're, we're purely conventional and it has been for, for 30 years. We we know our soil health is, isn't good. We want to sort yeah. it out. We want to do it as quick as possible while still trying to remain productive. Obviously, mm -hmm. the legume fallow isn't productive in terms of growing food, but it helps our soil. And then we can start being productive again after that, hopefully. Uh, yeah. Get out a conventional plow work and drill hopefully we can you know <clears throat> stop plowing look after ourselves a bit better mm -hmm. and yeah be productive yeah yeah, yeah exactly so uh, th there's a question here about moss and it kind of ties into what you're seeing soil structurally there is you know the moss is trying to stop soil losses in some ways you know stops um sort of protects that soil surface surface from raindrops it prevents you know if it got really dry, dust blowing or soil moving, soil is still moving when soils are like this. These are the bacterial dominated soils. Um, and so moss is not uh, moss is not a bad thing in itself. David White's asking this question, but um, it is an indicator that soils are not um, functional, right? So I don't want to see a lot of moss in whatever we're up to, um, whatever we're growing. All right, just aware of time, we'll keep on moving. Thanks so much, Tom and Chris, appreciate letting us ruffle. But yes, I think with the with the legumes, um, again, if you can get some kind of seed dressing to go down with them, um, I, I would prefer to see some diversity if you can. But it might be part of your um, tiered scheme or your payments, I imagine. So legumes are great for feeding fungi. So it is good to have them in there when we have soils that are potentially looking to balance. Who's up next, Victoria? Uh, Liz. Liz. Hi. Fire away, Liz. Tell us a little yes. bit. Um, so the background, so the three fields I've chosen. So I am, um, I'm uh, within a family farm, bottom end of Lincolnshire. So very quite rare for this bit of the world to have a mixed farm. So medium to heavy soils, quite a lot of clay over limestone. Uh, rainfall, 22 inches. So relatively low rainfall area on the eastern mm -hmm. side um and uh yeah probably we farm about six just over just under 600 acres of which half of it is owned and most of the owned land is under arable the rest of it we rent in grazing land so the three fields i've chosen one is uh, called north park and that is long-term parkland so it belonged to an estate um, so lots of mature tr oak trees, very nice. Um, second one is sort of two fields across from that. So used to be uh, parkland and then went through a 
quite a few hundred years of arable probably and now is in a grass lay and is looking a bit sad and then two fields the other way is an arable field so really relatively similar soil types all in one similar block but with a bit of change in history um the advance the hope is that the arable field will be going into a herbal lay next year. So part of this is seeing that transition. So it's a bit as Tom was talking about. So the, the last field, the one that was in park and now in grass, that's been grazed now? Yeah. So it's been, in a, it's been in a grass lay. It's actually with sheep at the moment, but cattle have been through it this season as well, but it's currently with sheep. Cool. Let's have a look at the north park. Um, the region platform first. Perfect. All right, the so Liz, red. what do you, yeah. <laughs> um, you have to start so at low web, I think, and then go up. This is what I'm yes. aiming for. Yeah, yeah, I think so. You know, we can trend to <laughs> regeneration. Uh, so North Park, this the one in the middle. This is the one that yeah. is. It's still Parkland. The Parkland. So there's deer or no? So it's sorry. It's um, it's basically it's like wood pasture. So it's like an uh, ancient Parkland. So it's still grazed with yep. sheep or cattle, but it's just got a lot of mature trees in it. And what was the... there's a photo there's a photo that sort of ex shows its occasional big tree um and what was the what was the weed that you did in your bricks bro uh, the one that scored 12 was the top of a nettle nettle yes you can understand you why see... animals eat the top yes <laughs> yeah they're not they're not silly and also um pointing to something biologically that or well, nutritionally that's happening in parklands which is the um, accumulation of potassium from animal manure and also nitrates so thinking of your nettle as being potentially a nitrate and a potassium indicator which is why you see them where animals are camping see them underneath the edges of trees and woodlands but uh, when we see that much difference in in the bricks then suspect that these are good conditions for nettles is what that bricks barometer is telling you um four worms yeah, and, it and no nettles. it was under a tree and it was it under was a tree under, yeah okay excellent can we see the pictures Vic right north park region indicators let's look at the riso sheath for the riso sheath discussion because we haven't talked about that one yet so nice so we're looking at so how did you measure your 80 percent of roots how deep did you say that 80 percent was uh i can't remember the number but it was basically where that riso sheath started to like the the main clod started to fall apart was the depth it was about eight centimeters yeah so when we're looking for riso sheaths, it's it, are we seeing um, like can you see naked roots or actually do those roots covered in either these crumbs or actually a whole um, sheath of these crumb structures all along so that you can't actually see roots at all? These are really important for resilience. So really important when thinking about climactic variability, um, soils drying up, wet cold hot temperatures is the the more developed these riser sheaths are then the more resilient you're going to be what's also interesting is those riser sheaths can have as much as two units difference in ph so your soil could um be alkaline at nine or it could be acidic at five but yet the plant is still experiencing seven so it means that that riser sheath ensures that nutrients are still available um so I wouldn't say this was a hugely developed riser sheet that just looks more to me like you've got clods stuck deeper down and just quite a dense soil. Um, yeah. But can we look at the next picture? Because I think that, yeah, that one. Oh, okay. It's pretty much the, the same, right? Was it hard to get the shovel in the ground? Medium. Medium. But, and it, yeah, and it just looked very dry. So you don't know whether that was just the soil has, was dry and sticking to them. It didn't, I wasn't convinced they looked happy. 
did you did you wet these faces like why is that soil darker in your hand than the one to the left could just be my dodgy phone but no I didn't wet them <laughs> So uh, sometimes when we want to look at um, how dark, and especially if you're looking at the darkness, like your your more organic material, microbial activity at the top will make soils more dark, more organic, and more carbon. And if we want to look at color, then it's a good idea to actually wet these surfaces. These soils do look dry. That's why those, those soils, yeah, are quite different in color than the next two or the one that's but sitting on the shovel. I did yeah. get the organic matter levels are back from this, and that's eight percent. That isn't yeah. at depth. That's just on a on a top sample, but it's about eight. And of the three fields I've selected, it is the highest organic matter. But you would expect that from its management, yeah, or history. History. Um, excellent. If we go down a little bit, see the fifth column, bottom row. Can you click on that? Yeah. Uh, which one? That one. Yep. Right where you are. Okay. Oh, okay. Just a worm sleeping. But you see, you don't have you don't have a lot of thatch on the top of that surface. We don't have. Um, so sometimes you see organic material that's not broken down, old roots, all the rest of it. For and often we see this in old parkland. So that's actually not too bad. The infiltration. So so this has moved on to that temporary lay and oh. it's a longer term. So yeah, it's just, it, this is a different field. Okay. So in the parkland and the North Park, did you see any thatch? A little bit, probably more than here, but okay. still not excessive. Okay. So it's just something to note um, and to take a photograph of and put in your regen platform, make some notes, because it is the thing that we want to see breaking down. Can we go to the photo to the left? Yeah, yeah. You said there was some insect pressure. What kind of insects are you seeing? So there there was some mealy bugs, which I don't think you can see on that. So I saw a few, um, but I couldn't. No. I think that was just, I don't know what that was trying to achieve, but um, there was a bit, of, but I didn't see the common one would be leather jackets and I didn't find any of them. Probably they've yeah. all gone by now, but. Yeah. And that's a really good observation to make is if, if you know that you might have, you know, different insects on the wing and it might be leather jackets or some of these um, black beetles or whatever, you want to go and look online and see what the life cycle of these organisms are. When are they flying um, and try and dig holes and catch when you're going to see a lot of that root damage um, or insects prevalence. Um, I think one of the other one of the other farms, we've got some pretty good mealybug photos. Um, no, anything else that you saw that was quite interesting, or any observations, Liz? I just think it's one? well, you um, it's worth well, it's a little slightly depressing, but the I did some infiltration rates on the two parkland fields in the winter, and they were like fifteen minutes long, like ridiculous. But as I said earlier, we got a bit bored. These ones were a lot quicker. I was yeah. and this I did it before we had a blast of rain came through. So I did it before then. And so I was expecting the infiltration rates to be as bad as they were when I did them in the winter. But they mm -hmm. actually were surprising. But it just everything just feels very tight. Yeah. And um so yeah, we and we're I suppose we're assuming because we're in on top of limestone that we have most of these fields haven't had any calcium applied for a long time. Yeah. Because the pH looks right. That's right. And it's interesting is you can be sitting on limestone and still have calcium deficiency. So asking the plant, can we go to the, the last column and the second row from the bottom, that one on the North Park and just click on that. Yep. That field observation. Last column. Sorry. Excellent. Is just the observations um, from above ground, you know, looking at color. Um, looking at evenness of grazing, um, you know, you see there's quite, you've got those dark, dark patches. You want to take a look and see, you know, is that, are those nitrogen indicators? Is that potassium indicators? Because they, they can look similar, you know, is it a urine patch and then it'll be nitrogen? Is it um, potassium? And then it, that'll be a manure patch. It looks like there's quite a bit of grass pull in there. So see the 
plants are actually sitting on the surface. Um, and if we zoom, if you zoom into that, you'll see little roots. So is that a, is that a native species that pulls, or is that um, merely by? It would. Um, some of it would be a bent, and yep. some of it might be rooks, which sounds ridiculous, but we do. Oh, there's yeah. quite a lot of yeah. rooks about. Yeah. Um, and some of it could be animals eating it and then spitting it out. So it's a mm -hmm. but I, um, I, yeah, I have. I to be honest, I don't look that often for insect pressure, but it could be insect pressure. I'm just I don't look for that mm -hmm. enough probably. If if it's during animal grazing. Um, and they, when they take a mouthful, they're actually taking roots, then I would suspect mealybugs. So something's undermined that plant plant's ability yeah. to hold on. Like you, when you're grazing, the, the, those roots shouldn't be coming up, but those rooks are probably after some kind of pasture pest as well. So looking at what, what where do you see bird activity? And it, it's amazing, isn't it? When you see them going for like root weevils, they'll just go nuts. They can hear them under the ground. It's pretty cool um excellent oh well thanks liz that's great to Thank see you. and then is it dan hi dan victoria if you want to pull the soil mentor the region platform up while dan's giving us some history that'd be good okay. right so um i'm dan herdman um i live not so far away from tom just a little bit further up the hill um, we have a, a hill farm. It's roughly about 470 um, hectares, um, 300 of which are um, all heather. So um, a lot of peat um, and stuff like that. Um, we run roughly about 400 head of uh, chiviots and black face up here, sheep. Um, and then we run another roughly about 200 um, uh, Aberfield cross sheep with um then we have another sort of 30 Aberdeen Angus on top of that with another 30 um, replacements and stuff like that um like I said we're a we're a hill farm um little place called Blanchland um we do get quite a bit of rain quite a bit of wind I don't know whether you can hear it behind me it's it's uh, rattling off the uh rattling off the doors at the moment um so that's pretty much um a picture of the farm the three uh, tests that we did, uh, test one was um, allotment fields that we we predominantly have um, roughly around 350 to 400 sheep on um, over over the summer, roughly with 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 the lambs and stuff on top of that. Um, these are well, they, they, about 50, 60 years ago, they they were actually heather and themselves and got converted back to grass. Um, they're quite a dry, um, sandy sort of soil underneath. You'll probably see from from some of the photos. Um, so yeah, we it's been ran conventionally um, past couple of years. Um, we actually used to be organic as well uh, for about a fifteen year sort of period. I think we we, we finished that in about twenty thirteen, um, and then just thought it was a great idea to start putting fertilizer on fields and. And um, doing doing what everybody else was doing, and um, just lost a lot. Well, not lost a lot of money, but you know, um, it didn't really pay off. So it was great when we started um, doing this regenerative stuff. It's really um, sort of focused our attention and and given us another sort of um, mindset, thought process of of where we want to be and where we're going, sort of um, in the future. Um, so test two um, was a field that we um, first trialed some regenerative um, mob grazing and things like that on. Um, so we tried we tried that um, two years ago. We started doing this. Um, so that's been actually interesting to see how that's progressed quicker than. Um, the other fields that we've we've just sort of really started this year by doing the regenerative uh, practices and stuff. So th that's been quite interesting to see it being that one step further ahead in terms of grass growth and recovery rates and things like that. Um, and then the last test that we did, test three, um, is the hot burn field, which is a very wet field, um, especially 
on on the west side of it it's it's very close to a wood and it only gets sunlight for sort of half the day and then it's just in shadow for the rest of it um lots of rushes in it um and just yeah we've been we've been trialing out this time around with with keeping the cattle condensed on on certain areas to sort of knock back the the rushes themselves um we've seen some good results with them but on the really wet areas it has just sort of plodged it up and it hasn't really ever recovered um so any ideas of how we can solve these issues would be fantastic oh excellent thanks dan can we take a look at photos um Beautiful. Right, so test two humpy field. Yep, that one where your cursor is, just click on that. Um, so, okay, so, so yeah, this this is sort of the top end of the of the humpy field. Um as you can see, a lot of grass here can I don't know, you, sort of lower down the field, um, a lot less grass. This one just recovers so well now. Um, these have been in sort of a 30 day um, mob grazing rotation with a, um, a leader follower system with the sheep going out first and then the cattle coming in behind. Um, this has actually hasn't been grazed for about 60 days now. Um, so we took some brick samples from, from this area. Um, grass came back at about two and the thistles and the nettles and the dockens that you can see there I did a separate test for each one of those and they came back at about a five. I'm always envious of people that are happy to do a nettle test and put that into a <laughs> I want good pair of gloves, that's all I can say. <laughs> Legend. Um, and when you look through that refractometer and you're looking um, at the bricks of the grass, was the line very sharp? No, it was a fuzzy line. Yeah, good. So when we see that line go sharp, that can be an indicator. That is an indicator. So three and below sharp line is an indicator for nitrates. So um, I wouldn't necessarily suspect this is nitrates. Is that Coxwood? What are we looking at? It's, it's a bit nitrate. of a yeah, probably probably quite a bit of Coxwood and stuff in there. It's never been it's never been plowed. It's never been touched. This is just as is. Um, yeah. I mean, we've been on the farm for about twenty seven years now. Um, so nothing barring the odd application of maybe a bit of fertilizer or gypsum and lime. We've been trialing a bit on this field a couple of years back. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all it has. Yeah. And is that Heather in the background? What's there? Is it someone spraying? That's Heather. So yeah, that's that's the neighbor's fell. But I was very, very similar from that. Um, I would start running up northwards. Um, so, yeah. I often think of Heather in terms of our biological indicator as being a soil that's not, it's sleepy. That we yeah. think of the soil as just, just not having a lot of activity at all. And that's where, you know, um, adaptive grazing, animal impact like this can actually maintain um, it, it into a grass system. Can we go back, Vic? Um, where's the soil from that humpy field? A bit further down. Not been, not been. Um, I'm going to that. Must be on number two, I think. Next page. So see how you can search, actually search for specific images if you're looking for it. Um, yeah, go right where your cursor is. So the last column. Yeah, click on that one. So the water, the water infiltration, yeah, this will be this will be it. It was very poor. It I stopped it at twenty minutes. I just didn't go past that. Um, yeah. We have had quite a significant amount of rainfall, like like Tom. Um, so that might have influenced the the test a little bit. Yeah. Um, but saying that, um, the allotment field that we did, um, that that was. Once I dug the hole, it was actually bone dry in the bottom of it. For all we've had a hell of a lot of, a lot of rain, that was absolutely bone dry. And the infiltration was, I think it was about three minutes, somewhere like that, maybe a little bit less for the first first one. But it's a great thing to do and a great observation to make is, you know, we can think we've had a lot of water 
Um, I was on a property recently that had had 25, 250 millimeters of rain in a week. And I thought, well, we can't dig holes. It's going to be too wet. And, you know, we dug holes in these beautiful crumbly soils. And it was a, it was a wake up call for me of just, you know, we might have had a lot of water, but if your soils are functioning well, you know, we could still sit on them um that you know these soils are absorbing this water so i think being able to compare this like you've done and see actually even though we've had a lot of water this really is about um structure so see how structureless that that yeah. soil really is you know we're not seeing a lot of crumbs the crumbs are very fine um and so thinking about adequate recovery and also who are we feeding so when you're coming in and we're on you know, 30 day rotations, then all you feed is bacteria. So what we, what we, what we then feeding is just green grass, manure, urine, if we're fertilizing, then that stimulates bacteria as well. And what we can actually see is soils that start to collapse. So being able to dig holes and take a look mm -hmm. and say, has my root system adequately recovered? So your roots here are half the depth that they were I believe in the other field, in the heavier field. So just observing, am I getting root recovery? Um, because just because a plant looks like it's ready to graze on top, it might not be ready down below. Um, can we look at the next picture? Victoria, I think there's one below it. Yeah, that one there, the test two. It's got the ruler. So would you say most of your roots were sitting around that seven, eight centimeter mark in this field? Certainly in this field, yeah. Um, I did a couple of holes and yeah, it was, it, they're all roughly there. But I mean, the, it was very difficult to actually pull that, pull the, the whole sort of sod to bits. And yeah. especially when you're doing the shake test and, and, and things like that to, to expose the roots and stuff. So everything was very tight. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it does look really tight. Can we take a look at the photos in the um in the wetter field? Um if we go yeah with the hot burn field. Yeah. Um you just yeah, yep, yeah, there you are. Perfect. So you see there that has got some structure. Um so if you start there uh on the fifth column if you go up and to the right yeah that one would be fine lovely photo if we didn't have the sun there that would actually be quite stunning um but see you have got root penetration it still looks pretty tight but 20 mm -hmm. 20 centimeters so if we go to the photo beforehand where we can see the soil a little clearer yep beautiful so we can see aggregation. You see the soils do look really wet. This has not got rushes in it. See the riser sheath? So you can actually see it in that bottom third. So you can actually see that the soil is sticking. Oh, yeah, lovely. Yeah. Its soil is sticking right to it. Now, this is not an indicator of mycorrhizal activity. I think for a long time I thought it would be, but it's really just an indicator of that, the you know, the roots are pumping the sugars and different material to feed um, the microbes and there's mucilage and root hairs and root material and all sorts of stuff in there, but that is your plant defense system. If we can go back, I think there's some pictures of some of the... Um, yeah, there'll, there'll be some pictures of, um, of the really sort of wet areas with the rushes and things yeah. like that. Maybe it's on page two. Yeah, okay, with those, yeah. So that top right with the ruler, yeah. So these are the we we think of these as the glade soils. So when we when we're losing um, carbon, when soils get too wet, they start to off gas, and when they do that, then they, you're actually losing nutrients as well. So you're losing by having wet soils, we start to lose one aggregation. You can see that, um, and you're losing carbon, you're losing nitrogen, um, and these. And you see at the bottom, those are the rush roots that those kind of thick yeah. gnarly. What's cool about them though, is they pump their own oxygen down. So we can sometimes see these um, glade soils can have big flecks of red. And that's because 
um, the iron has reacted with that oxygen and basically making rust. And it's because of what these rushes are doing. Can we look to the left or right? I think there's another image of this. Um, yeah, let's take a look at that. So, yeah, I can. Do you think this would be a wetland if you weren't here? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know whether to make it a sort of an exclusion sort of area and just let it do what it does and see what happens. But yeah. yeah. So the questions we want to ask are, you know, is this soil tight and sticky like this because it's a mineral imbalance? You know, and there's particular minerals that will make soil sticky. One is high magnesium. The other one's high potassium. Um the other one could be low calcium. So just taking a look at what's happening mineral wise um, or has it been historic management? You know, we can we can flocculate soils. You can run aerators over the soils, you know, putting animals on this when it's like that. You just you're going to exacerbate, potentially exacerbate, I would guess. I mean, because really up until, sorry, up until this year, um, there really hasn't been many animals go on it because they just don't like going on it. Yeah. Um, simply. So they might pick a bit of grass here and there around about the rushes and things like that, but generally they just don't go on it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I keep running through those questions and try and work out what potentially is going on here. Um, you know, is there a hard pan is there something deeper down is it just where water is draining into is there a natural spring you know run through those kind of questions and go well yeah where is this tending to naturally or is it something that's happened historically um so the more bacterial dominated we get then again we lose structure and it just means that water doesn't move appropriately through these soils so we have poor air and water movement can create these boggy boggy zones um but we've shifted some of these soils by addressing whatever that limiting factor is. So, you know, if you can figure out why, you know, what's the underlying behind this yeah. um, and maybe look at introducing seeds of plants that are going to cope when it's a little wetter that have some of these big roots root systems. So we've got something for treading and something that's going to be more palatable because cattle certainly don't want to be eating rushes. Um, Although saying that when I when I did a few bricks readings of the um, rushes, like the new growth rushes, they were coming back at about five as well. Yeah, yeah, we don't generally see rushes with very high um, bricks. They're often very high in silica, and um, there's just aspects to rushes, obviously, that make them very palatable. Um, interesting. All right, I think we've have we only got five minutes left, guys. Is that right? Yes. Um, so maybe we'll just have five minutes. Is there any particular things that you can, that you guys see that you want to discuss? Just going back to the, the Russian stuff, could you use something like a vermicast or something like that to, to put on? Or is it worth doing the samples and stuff first before doing that? If it's not costing you any money, um, but yeah, I, I I would I would take a look and just just see if it's more likely to be a mineral issue than a. The biology is secondary. You know, we end up with high bacterial soils because these conditions are being made potentially because of, um, and that's I mean you guys have put gypsum on in the past, you know, taking a look at is it is it gypsum. But if you don't address what that limiting factor is and then you aerate or rip it or whatever and you don't address this, it's just going to go back to being sticky again. Yeah. But, yeah, I think this is a great start. I'm really impressed. I'm really impressed with all the photos you guys have taken um, and the time you've taken into this. And the, the value really is now being able to come back um, in another year's time and look at are these indicators improving um, we have noticed on some properties that actually it just even going through this exercise and being able to compare you know best performing worst performing it's actually meant that you can see that something's coming you can see that something's starting to decline and you can quickly change um, grazing or um, 
you know, thinking about plant selection. So I, I feel like this can be a really valuable tool um, before you have a situation that can be really difficult to overcome. Nicole, can I ask a question? Just so we've we've done our three fields uh, and big learning curve. Is the intention should be that we should do every field, uh, but would we do that once a year, or uh, what's the kind of frequency of it um, that that you would recommend? Um, I I recommend not to not create something that becomes overwhelming. So this is why I say if you can if you can choose the same soil type and do best and worst. So you might have three different soil types. So you might actually have six areas that you are sampling. And I would try and do this in the same place every year. But knowing that, I think it's still um digging holes can start to become addictive. So just go, just go start digging holes and start noticing, you know, where do we see areas that are performing well? Um, where did, you know, where am I seeing areas that are declining in production and just get into the habit of digging holes? But yeah, to do this whole regen platform, I would do that once a year. Okay. And if, if is there any, um, I mean, obviously we've been trying to dig holes here where the ground's totally saturated. This ain't the right time to be doing it. Is there a right time to be doing it? Um, yeah, for the for the regen platform, probably spring, I, I find. But spring or, or autumn, if it's not too wet, you guys, some of you have had a lot of moisture. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're trying to hit that Goldilocks where it's not too wet and not too dry zone. But if the plants... Yeah, plants are actively yeah. growing. That's a good time. Yeah, when plants are growing, so on the owl operation, really, it wants to be in the spring. Mm -hmm. when the plants are growing, rather than we've just taken them on a stubble where there's no crop growing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but then at least indicators are, you know, how well is stubble being incorporated? We should still see a lot of earthworms, you know, bringing that stubble into the ground. And I would have noticed is everyone seems to have pretty low worms. Hmm. Are there any more questions? Oh, Philip Snowden's asked a question. Uh, sharp oh, yeah. line indicating nitrate. So if it's uh, if it's a bricks of three or below, and it's a sharp line, that is an indicator of nitrates. If you have um, sharp lines in general, then that's an indicator that we don't have a lot of dissolved solids, in particular calcium and phosphorus, but um, yeah, so that you want that line to be really blurry. Um, that's a pretty good indicator, and we do want that to be higher. I do notice higher rainfall environments. You have more water in the plants um, that we see lower bricks, but that doesn't mean that you can't get higher bricks. I, we've worked in temperate environments with a lot of moisture who are running in the early 20s in their pasture in dairy farm systems and see significant improvements in milk production. Um, on those high bricks pastures. So those of you that have got low bricks around two and three, that's a good, it's a starting point, right? The only place is up in my mind. So look at the, what's happening. Why is your bricks running low? Great. Yeah. I think I think that wraps it up. And just to say thank you very much, um, Nicole and the farmers. Uh, it's been super interesting. And a great uh, taster for uh, how field data in the Soil Mentor app can uh, can help improve decision making longer term. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thanks, Tom. Thanks so much to the team. Thanks, Kathy, for organising this. Appreciate it. Thanks, All right, guys. you guys have a great thank evening. Thank, thank you. you very much. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Thanks, Bye. Take care.